have your Bibles, you'll turn with me, amen, to the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in the 27th chapter, verse 45, amen. Matthew 27, beginning at verse 45, amen. And I'm going to do a little bit of reading today, so if you'll bear with me, we're going to read uh, several verses of Scripture here, amen, beginning at verse number 45 now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour and about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying Eli Eli lama sabachthani which is to say my God my God why hast thou forsaken me some of them that stood there when they heard this, heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks did rent. That, that doesn't mean the rocks tumbled over. It meant the rocks split. You see, when, when God ripped the veil in the, in the temple, that veil was not to just keep people out. It was to keep God's holy presence in. And when Christ yielded up the ghost, God ripped it and said, not only is there a way for me to come to you, but now there's a way for you to come to me. Praise God. You don't need a high priest. Jesus became that high priest. Amen. I love verse 52. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Y'all know what that means? Dead folks got up. And it came and came out of the grave after his resurrection and went to the holy city and appeared. Under. How freaked out would you have been when grandma come walking in the door? Your dead great, dead great aunt Ethel comes walking in. Your brother Bob, who passed away two years ago, comes walking in. That's a trippy situation. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things which were done, that means the people around there saw dead people coming up out of graves. They feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there beholding afar off, which Jesus, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, the mother of Zebedee's children. And when the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Amen. That's where this story leaves Jesus being placed in the tomb. I want to for a little while preach something that the Lord gave me. I had something else totally prepared. And I love it when God plays the shell game. And so I want to preach something that I feel the Lord has laid on my heart simply entitled, What's in it for me? What's in it for me? How many has asked that question before? What's in it for me? 
I pray that I'll be able to answer that question before this service is over and you'll be able to find out what's in it for you. Amen. Let's pray together right now. Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful for your presence, your anointing. Lord, I pray that in this place today, you would let your great spirit, Lord, let it resound in this place. Let it flow into this house, oh God. I pray right now, Lord, that you would break forth into this house, oh God, through resurrection power, oh God, that you would bring enlightenment, oh Lord, upon this church. Lord, that you are not a God of some fairy tale. You are not some mystical character of long ago, but you are the risen Christ. I pray that today our hope would be renewed in you and in the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. Would you thank the Lord for that resurrection power today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Before you're seated, shout, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? Amen, you can be seated. This is, this is a, a horrible time in the life of the believers of Christ, the, the, the many disciples. This was a, a terrible time for them. To be living in a time where you had left everything that you had ever known to follow this man. It wasn't like coming to church on Sunday or, or Wednesday. It was following this man and giving up everything you had ever loved and known. Walking away from careers, walking away from business and enterprise, just turning away from it. And following a man who would just simply say, come, follow me. Made no promises, but just that vague invitation, just follow me. And they, they followed Jesus. They trusted him and they followed him. Now, we fast forward to uh, now three and a half years later that they, the 12 in particular have been following him faithfully. And we find them at the Last Supper, which is a beautiful picture of, of God trying to deal with humanity and humanity not understanding the consequences of what God is trying to do in their life. Amen. Uh, I've often said, and I think it is of importance to note, that, that at the Last Supper that there were, there were 12 lords, but there was only one servant. There was 12 who wanted to be served and only one who was willing to serve. There was 12 who was arguing over their positioning in the kingdom and what they would get out of being in the kingdom. But, but there was one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who wrapped a towel around his waist and with a basin of water, he took upon himself that job of the lowliest of servants in the household as he began to wash their feet. Indignant so they were that even Simon Peter refused and told the Lord, you will not wash my... Can you imagine telling God something you ain't going to do? I mean, we do it all the time, but could you imagine him doing that to his face? To his flesh and bone face, you look at him as the great God of eternity, robed in flesh, is kneeled in servile manner before you, and you look into his eyes and say, you ain't going to do that for me. The Lord understood how Peter needed to be dealt with, and Simon Peter was not a man you dealt gently with. He, he did not understand gentle nuances of suggestion uh, Simon Peter only understood <laughs> amen I tried to convince my dad my whole childhood I'm not the son you have to spank to get my attention just speak the word and thy servant will obey but he didn't he didn't do that he unfurled that 46 inch belt and he did not hold back on my backside with that thing. Amen. Uh, and the other, they didn't bother my brother, but they bothered me. And so he dealt with Simon Peter, how Simon Peter needed to be dealt with. He rebuked him in a very, in a very stern, but very loving manner when he said, Simon, if I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part in my kingdom. And Simon Peter fell back into the chair and slumped his shoulders and said, Oh God, if that's what it takes, don't just wash my feet, but wash my hands and wash my head and wash all of me. 
How many times do we miss the mark because our humanity can't understand the divinity of what God is trying to do in our life? How many times do we reject the move of God in our life or the direction of God in our life because we think we understand it better and we have a better plan? I learned a long time ago, amen, that if I ever want to make God laugh, just tell God my plans. I become the comedian. God gets tickled at our plans because his plans for us are grander. Amen. And it may take more weaving and it may take more side roads and back roads and, and it may take a little coming up on the rough side of the mountain, but eventually God will get you to where he wants you to be if you can just trust his divine plan for your life. Can you say amen? And so there in the upper room, they're arguing, they're fighting over who's the most important. They they were fighting over job titles and who was going to be this and who was going to be that. I remember hearing the story one time of, uh, of how the pastor uh, had uh, some young men on his uh, on his team and uh, he began to teach them about how that uh, it's not important what your title is. It's important what you are but called of God and that you fulfill that role. Amen. So much so that one of them made that his mantra as he prayed and as he exhorted. He would always say, I don't need a a title to be used of God. Uh, God can just use me. He kind of made that his mantra. Amen. And then uh, sometime later, that pastor gave seemingly the most, the less studious, the, the one that didn't seem to have it all together, a position and a title in the church. And the one young man who said he didn't need a title got offended. Amen. He tucked tail and ran home with his bottom lip sticking out. And the pastor called him and said, what's wrong? And he said, oh, nothing's wrong. And finally the conversation went as they got together and met and come to find out it did hurt his feelings that this guy who he thought was less qualified got a title in the church amen and what the young man exposed and he didn't even realize he said it he said well it didn't bother me that I didn't have a title as long as nobody else had one And now the disciples are around the table. They're divvying up the kingdom of Christ. They're sitting around the table saying, I'll get this portion and I'll do this and I'll get this portion and I'll do that. All the while, they are missing the plan of God upon the earth that God had anointed them and called them to preach the gospel to all the world. And they missed the moment. They missed the moment in which Jesus was trying to teach them that one last lesson before he would die. Amen. Man, now we watch the crucifixion as it begins to unfold in those last two or three days in the life of Christ. We see the surrounding torments and sufferings of Christ. Amen. His best friends who are walking in the shadows, skulking behind the crowd. Amen. Like a, like a wary animal around the trash pile. They are just hiding from this brutal display of religious hatred and murderous fervor that the crowd had. Now it's easy to chide the disciples for their unbelief. It's easy to berate them for their lack of vision. It's easy to scold the disciples, amen, for not hanging around and seeing the miracle that would happen on that first resurrection morning, amen. But can I say this to us? Before we get too hard on the disciples, might I remind us that none of us were there either. You see, they didn't have a drama to sit through. They didn't have an Easter play to watch. They didn't have a movie to tell them how this whole thing was going to end. They had never been there for that. And for them, that Friday was anything but good. It was anything but pleasurable. All their hopes had been dashed. Their dreams had been crushed. Amen. And I can hear them saying in the back of their mind, what's in it for me? I gave my everything and now this man is being beaten with all that they have. And what's in it for me? See, they had been with him at the Last Supper as he, he, he mysteriously spoke about the one that would betray him. And, and the heart, their hearts begin to fill with fear, Brother Chase. They, they, they begin to cry out to the Lord, is it me? Is it me? Am I the one? Am I the one that's going to betray you? Can I just pause here and simply say this? Amen. It does us well to make sure, amen, that our heart is right with God because here was 12 men who had walked three and a 
half years in the shadow of Jesus and Jesus said one of you suckers is about to betray me and every single one of them said is it me is it me is it me you know what those 12 disciples understood that they will never get spiritual enough that their flesh will not betray the principles that Christ had put in them can I challenge you here this afternoon you'll never worship enough you'll never shout enough you'll never pray or fast enough or come to church enough that your flesh does not want to be flesh that your carnal nature will not want to be carnal nature you got to throw yourself on the altar and say God I don't want to I don't want to be the Judas I don't want it to be me they were there when Judas Judas came and he betrayed Jesus with a kiss they saw the horror of the religious leaders and their personal army as they came around Jesus and they felt a burst of hope when Jesus said, I can pray to my father and he'll give me 12 legions of angels. Then instant despair when he continued. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? What's in it for me, they asked. They had followed Jesus at a distance, lurking in the shadow outside the gates as he would put through the mockery of six trials between night and morning. We often think that the crucifixion just happened in a few short hours, but that's not the case. It went all night long. Before he went to Pilate for the first time, he had already been before Ananias, the high priest, before Caiaphas, the priest, before the Sanhedrin council, and it wasn't until daybreak that they brought him to Pilate. Then they took him to Herod, and then they brought him back to Pilate. They had seen Jesus scourged until he could no longer stand under his own power. His skin literally ripped off in huge uh, gaping patches. Uh, they strapped him to a wooden post in Pilate's courtyard. Uh, and there those Roman soldiers took a cat of nine tails, nine uh, lashes of leather that had braided into it broken pieces of pottery and jagged bones. Uh, and when they slapped it across his back, uh, it hooked into his flesh and it ripped meat from bone. Uh, amen. And most scholars believe by the time they finished whipping the back of Christ it was nothing but chunks of flesh with exposed bones and internal organs as he sat there shivering and quivering from the pain they then took a crown of thorns and they didn't gently just set it on his head but they took a crown of thorns set it on his head and used wooden instruments to shove it into his skull and into its brow and there the disciples watched peeking through the crowd uh, wondering what's in it for me after all I've already given up everything that I ever had uh, I've left my family to follow Christ uh, I've left my career to follow Christ uh, and now everything that I've loved and thought I was going to have uh, is literally being ripped apart in front of me see that beautiful face of Messiah as blood is dripping off of it uh, as the council of the Sanhedrin all night long uh, took their fist and pounded in the face of Jesus calling him a blasphemer as they grabbed his beard and ripped it from his face and chunks of meat and hair follicles fell to the floor the Bible lets us know that they pummeled him and they beat him so much that his countenance was permanently marred and he seemed like a grotesque caricature of a human his own mother could not even recognize him and from the distance I can see the disciples say but what's in it for me I've followed you three and a half years and I've given you the best years of my life and now he's being shredded in front of me what's in it for me they watched engulfed by the angry mob scared for their very lives pulling cloak over face and running to the hills as the crowd began to scream crucify him you see they had held out one more hope that surely somebody from the crowd would step up and say not this man you see me and these nine other fellows were lepers but we came in contact with this man Jesus and he healed us of our leprosy but the ten lepers were silent maybe Jairus' daughter could have ran up and said I was dead but that man raised me to life where was the woman with the issue of blood where was the woman caught 
in the very act of adultery. Even the best friend of Jesus, Lazarus, who laid rotting for four days in a tomb, wasn't even there to protest. No, the entire mob turned on him in an instant and cheered, crucify him. I can see the steps of those disciples as they ran. I can see them as they begin to flee from the horror of what was about to happen to them. And then they see him, a man taken down uh, that road down to Golgotha. Amen. And then they take him to the top of Calvary and they stretch him out upon a wooden beam, broken and bleeding. Amen. I know Mel Gibson did his best, but there's no image that Hollywood could come up with to show you how grotesque that Calvary was. But what's in it for me? I could hear Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene say, I gave him my all, and now my all is about to die on a tree. There they, the ring of the hammers would ring out every time that it slapped the nail. Every time that hammer hit the nail, there was a flinching in their body. What's in it for me? Everything I loved is right here. All my hopes have now been dashed. It's a mangle of human flesh on a wooden beam. And then they hoist him up in the air. They suspend that beautiful Christ between the heaven and the earth. And as they do, and his body lurches forward upon the nails. And the blood begins to spill forth out of him. You could hear the groans and the cringes. You could hear the lustful cries of blood from the crowd. But you could faintly hear the sobs of his mother as only one disciple is left there. And that is John. And Jesus looks out over the crowd. And he sees out in that crowd people with eyes affixed like a spectator at a Super Bowl. With such rocked him and they laughed at him. I know it's an ugly picture in modern day Christianity doesn't ever want you to see this but can you see him hanging on that cross? More a hunk of meat than man. Hanging from that cross as ribbons of flesh hung from his body. That body quivered and shook. That body trembled and wept. That body that had that body that had cured the sick. That body that had walked on water is now hanging a upon that cross and they're thinking what's in it for me I left everything to follow this man what is in it for me and there Jesus cries out for his mama he's watching out for his mama and he looks at her and says woman behold thy son and son behold thy mother even in his last conscious moments he was thinking about his family and then he cries out Eli Eli lama sabachthani my God my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I know you've heard the story a million times, but Mary Magdalene had never heard the story, and John had never heard the story, and Mary had never heard the story, and their guts begin to turn as they hear the voice of God made flesh begin to cry out, I feel forsaken, I feel alone, I feel forsaken. Somebody in the crowd got a great gag and a great kick out of saying he thinks that he's Elias and they went and they got some vinegar and they shoved it into his mouth that bitter bitter taste of vinegar and it was then that he heaved up one last time upon those nail pierced hands and he cried out the infamous words it is finished he dropped his head and he gave up the ghost you see you don't die from a crucifixion you don't die from blood loss you don't die from the pain you die from suffocation so there the Roman soldiers went and began to break the legs of the thieves on either side so they could no longer push up with their legs and they would eventually suffocate you see the Romans were masters at torture they had been doing this for hundreds of years they knew exactly what the human body could stand and so by the time they got to Jesus that Roman soldier took that spear rather than break his legs he took the spear and thrust it into his side and as we know blood and water flowed out of it but did you know the reason why they did not break his legs because the prophecy said that not a bone of his body should be broken they, 
They couldn't even break his bones. Blood and water flowed out of him. He was dead. I could see Simon Peter skulking in the shadows of some tree far away, shivering in his own agony, realizing that yes, he did betray Jesus. And yes, he did turn on him. Amen. And there it was that, that they took him down from the cross. I read that in your hearing. Amen. And Joseph of Arimathea wanted his body and begged Pilate to don't give the body to the mob. The mob would have tore that body to pieces. They would have ripped him to pieces and thrown him in the trash heap. But Joseph of Arimathea took that body and he wrapped it in linen. And those ladies came and they put precious spices and ointment upon the body of Christ. Amen. They loved and cared for that broken body. But I can see them as they placed that precious broken bloody body in a borrowed tomb. I can see them as in their mind they begin to think, oh God, now what's in it for me? I've been marked now. I'm going to be an outcast. I've been marked now. I've followed Jesus all these years. They're going to come after me now. What's in it for me? Have you ever thought that before? I'm, I'm telling you, I've served God way too long to stop serving God now. Let, let me say that again. I've got too much invested in living for God for me to walk away now. I've come to encourage somebody this afternoon instead of saying what's in it for me, say what can I put into it to put more of me into it? What's in it for me? If I could sum up human nature in one phrase, that would be it. What's in it for me? If I could sum up the most basic nature of humanity into one phrase, it would be that phrase. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? What do I get out of this? I always go into a grocery store, any kind of store anymore. You want to sign up for a rewards program? I'll pay extra for you to just check me out without saying anything else. <laughs> My wife has signed up for every reward program from Best Buy to the soup kitchen. She's got it all. I go to the boot store and they say, do you have, an, do you have a rewards number with us at, at the Western Warehouse or Boot Barn, whatever it is? And I say no. And then my wife reminds me, no, I have her. Give them my phone number. I have the reward. Why? Because she understands it may only be a buck twenty-five every year, but something's in it for her. Something, something. I go to Target, and, and I can't even go to Target without her saying, "Take my card," because I get one point five percent back or five percent. Excuse me. Book the cruise. I get five percent back. My Lord, there's that mansion on the hill I've always wanted. Just keep shopping at Target. And it's what's in it for me? What's in it for me? What's in it for me? What's in Do you think the disciples did not have that same nature that you have? Do you not think they did not suffer from the same agony we suffer? If you wake up tomorrow and find out your retirement is zero, if you wake up tomorrow and find out you're upside down a million dollars in your house, amen, you would be crushed and you would be devastated for all that you had been investing in was now what's in it for me why do I invest in an IRA versus a Roth IRA? Why do I invest in a CD versus a savings account? Why? Because we're always thinking what's in it for me. The incentive is they're going to give you something back. But when they placed the broken body of Jesus Christ in the tomb, they weren't worried about 5% cash back from Target. They weren't worried about 1.5% back at Costco. The love, everything that they had ever loved. All of their hope and all of their passion was wrapped up in grave clothes and laying on a cold piece of stone. All of their hopes and dreams had been dashed and they're weeping and crying saying, what is in it for me? Peter got so frustrated, he said, oh, forget it. I'll go fishing. We often forget that just about 50 days before Simon Peter preached the New Testament church message, he backslid. Next time we see Simon Peter, he's walking off, going off, forget it, I'll just go fishing. 
Then we see him fishing naked on a boat in despair. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? What's in it for me? What's in it from everything I loved? Everything I was, how many people do I know that has unfortunately lost out with God because they got too attached to that what's in it for me? I'm getting nothing out of it. You see, I learned a long time. Can I pastor for about 45 seconds? I'm, I'm going to do it, so just hold on. I learned a long time ago the people that get discouraged and walk out on the church, amen, because the church ain't got nothing for them. I realized a long time ago they stopped putting deposits in the church and got mad when the ATM said there's no balance left. Amen. I want you to know if you want something out of living for God, you got to put something into living for God. Hallelujah. I know this is an Easter message. Amen. But sometimes you got to break the nature of self and what's in it for me. Amen. You got to turn it around and say, I'm in it for him. I'm in it for the long haul. I'm, if I never get blessed again, I'm still going to serve God. If I never healed, I'll still worship God. If he never touches me again, he's already been good to me. Somebody shout, what's in it for me? And they lay that body in the tomb, and all of a sudden, hell was rejoicing. They thought they had ridded themselves of this little prophetic upstart by the name of Jesus. Till all of a sudden, there came a knock on hell's gates. They had their music a little too loud. They couldn't hear him. And so Jesus did what Jesus does. He made a way where there was no way. And he kicked it open. You see, the flesh of Christ was laid up on. See, we celebrate the day God rose from the dead. God didn't raise from the dead. God didn't ever die. You can't kill God. They killed the manifestation. They didn't kill God. Because God descended. He did a cannonball backflip into hell. Boom. Because the last thing he screamed in the physical was it's finished. But the first thing he said in the spiritual was it ain't over. Satan began cowering and shivering. I recognize them footsteps. As he comes walking in and Satan turns and looks at God and says, whoa, 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 wait, 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 we had a deal. You don't come down here. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, you and I had an agreement. Death and hell belongs to me. Remember, Adam gave that up in the garden. He said, yeah, but uh, I come to get them back. Whoa, 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 whoa. You, 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 you can't give them back? Uh, uh, you, you can't get them back? I, I, I mean, who do you think you are? I'm God. No, you're Jesus. You're a dead prophet. No, I'm God. He didn't have to ask twice because even the devil knows how to obey the voice of God. And with trembling hands, those keys shook. As the first Adam gave up the keys, the Bible says Jesus is the second Adam. And the second Adam took what the devil stole. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I said the second Adam took what the first Adam gave away. And after Jesus took the keys to death, hell, and the grave, amen, he kicked the end out of the tomb and said, all power is given to me now. Both in heaven and in earth. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Hallelujah. 
The Bible said in Corinthians, Paul wrote and said, if the princes of this world would have only known, they would not have crucified the king of glory. Amen. The devil's a good devil, but he's a stupid devil. If he'd have only known what God was going to work in the body of Jesus Christ, he would have left him alone. But Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw men unto me. And when they lifted that cross in the air, hell made a fatal mistake stake because when that cross was lifted up Jesus drew all men unto him oh I feel like shouting this afternoon hallelujah Woo. Jesus gets up with all power in heaven and in earth. Let me jump over one chapter in the book of Matthew, chapter 27, beginning at verse number 2. Let's read the second half of our text. It said, And behold, there was an earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. I just love that. I mean, we, we, I think people overlook That just shows me God's got some panache. He's got some sass. Amen. God didn't just say angel roll away and stand over there like some pious you know angelic being that angel just rolled it over he plopped up there across the legs and how y'all like that and then awesome he just sat up on that rock, amen, like it was a recliner in grandma's living room, and he put his feet up on the edge of that thing, amen, and the angel rolled that stone back, and he sat upon it. Verse 3 said, his countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him, the keepers did shake, and became, in other words, that angel was so powerful, and that angel was so beautiful, that the people who were working security for the cemetery, Terry fell out, passed out dead. Uh, amen. They didn't die. It just knocked them out. Amen. When's the last time you've been so enthralled with the presence of the Lord that it just kind of. They became as dead men. Verse 5, and the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. I love verse 6, Brother Chase, because the angel now says, He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. And if you don't believe me, walk up in this house and see where his body was. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? Never before has emptiness ever offered so much. I said, never before has emptiness ever offered so much. Because when they walked into the empty tomb, they found out that the best thing that was in it for them was nothing. I'm going to let that settle in for just a little bit. That the best thing that was in it for them was nothing. Nobody. He wasn't there. And because he's alive, Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I said, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. If Jesus would have told them, you got an empty tomb, they wouldn't have understood it. They had to walk through the pain of the process and think, what's it? I've come to tell somebody, you know what's in it for you? An empty tomb, a resurrected Savior, life and life more. Never before has nothing meant so much to walk into that tomb and not see the lifeless decomposing body of Messiah. When they walked into that tomb and they saw a pile of old grave clothes laying right there on the part of where the tomb bed was and they gasped and they couldn't understand it. So the angel replied back, go quickly and tell all his disciples that he is 
risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him Lo, I told you. In other words, the angel said, I want you to go back and answer all their questions of what's in it for me. I want you to tell them that what's in it for them is he's not there anymore. He's alive. He's risen from the dead. He's not where he was. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost musicians as you come. This is why Paul would write in Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse number 10, and say, If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. I love verse number 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. You know what's in it for you? Life everlasting. You know what's in it for you? A hope beyond the grave. You know what's in it for you? Forgiveness of sin. You know what's in it for you? Healing because he took stripes upon his back. You know what's in it for you? Peace. That passes understanding. ladies came to the tomb they expected what was in it for them was Jesus body and they looked and saw a stone rolled away their hearts sunk they thought the Romans had taken his body but it wasn't until that angel said go check it out I know whom seek ye go check it out that they walked in and where mere seconds before their hearts was broken because nobody was in there. Seconds later, their hearts are leaping for the same reason. Nobody's in there. So what's in it for me, Pastor? An empty grave. What's in it for me, Pastor? A lot of emptiness. A lot of emptiness. Empty spot in hell where you should be. What's in it for me? Nothing. Not a thing. What? Okay, so you're telling me what's in it for me is nothing, yeah. What's in it for you, you don't have to go to hell. That's a pretty good bargain. I, I, I give my, my temporal life to him on earth. It's about 70 years and some change on the average. And I'll give that to him. I will serve him in the one-third of my body that is temporal. The other two-thirds are eternal. I'll serve him down here with this body. And then I get everlasting life. Let's see. A few days of trouble. Life is but a vapor. Okay. Eternity with the Lord. What, what, what's in it for me, Pastor? Oh, nothing. You know, you don't have to be addicted to drugs. People look at us and say, oh, you're living for God. Being a Christian. Being a Christian is boring. As opposed to what? Being in rehab facilities? Huh? But what's in it for me? Oh, um, I don't know. Um, how about 
not drinking yourself to death. How, how about not being bound by nicotine, getting emphysema and lung cancer? I can think of things I'd rather have than that. Have you ever known, have you ever known anybody addicted to something really bad? Isn't that horrible? Have you ever known anybody addicted to something in your life? Isn't it the worst thing? And you're like, you know, if you just stopped that, you'd be a lot better off. Now. Oh, but I can't. Yeah, it's awful. I mean, they'll shoot up heroin, know that the next shot they could take, it had fentanyl in it, and they're going to die like that. But they'll do it anyway. And those same people will look at you on Sunday afternoon at church and go, wrong with you people and I asked the same question what's wrong with you why are you so determined to split hell wide open we used to sing the old song I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain I'd rather have Jesus than anything. What's well, in it for me? How about Jesus and life everlasting? Well, if I do that, there's, there's rules. and I, Yeah, there, there's rules to being a drunk. There's rules to being an addict. There's rules to being an adulterer. You just don't you just don't know it. So I stand here on Resurrection Sunday and I say, I'll tell you what's in it for you. The emptiness of a grave is in it for you. And if this same spirit which raised up Christ from the dead dwelleth in your mortal bodies. I'll tell you what's in it for me. If the Lord tarries another 50 years, amen, I hope I live to be a ripe old age and in good health. But one of these days, this old body is going to heave out its last burst of air. But Sister Sandy, it don't stop there for me. Because of that emptiness. My life only just starts when I stop. I sleep in the realm of the physical, but in the spiritual, I'm more alive than I've ever been. Let me tell you what's in it for you, my brother. What's in it for you, my sister. The promise that one day your grave's going to be as empty as his. <laughs> One day, your grave is going to be as empty as his. Because at the sound of the trumpet, the dead in Christ are going to rise up out of their graves. Never before has emptiness ever meant so much. Hallelujah. Would you lift your hands to heaven? I'm about to open these altars right now. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Is there a prayer warrior that would reach into the spirit and just plug in right now on the Holy Ghost? There's a resurrection power in this house right now. In the name of Jesus, go ahead, pray. As the spirit gives you the utterance, you're praying down walls right now. You're praying off bondage right now in Jesus' name. I'm talking to some precious child of God. In this place, life has been a struggle. And man, you've been up against it, but I'm telling you, there's hope in this house. Let your running stop now. I'm talking to every child of God under my voice right now. Amen. Today, we celebrate. We celebrate the emptiness of a tomb. We celebrate that the grave is empty. And because that grave is empty, there's something for you called the grace of God. 
and the resurrection power of Christ. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to count to three, and when I do, I'm going to open these altars. I'm going to open these altars for somebody that says, I want today, amen, to be reassured. Today, I want to be reassured that I'm making heaven my home. It's Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate the emptiness of a tomb in the name of Jesus. We're not memorializing his life. We're celebrating it. One, get ready to run to this altar. Two, the presence of the Holy Ghost is in this house. Three, come on and meet me in this altar right now. Come on and meet me in this altar. He's in this place right now. Make heaven your home. Make heaven your home. Make heaven your home. I'm telling you, today he wants to turn it around for your life. Today he wants to turn it around for your life. Come on, come on, because you live. Because he lives, you can live. Because he's alive, you can be alive. You don't got to live in bondage. You don't got to live in the torment of your past. His empty grave is proof that you can live. His empty grave is hope that there is another opportunity to give your life to him today. Come on, come on, come on. It's the goodness of God pulling for you right now. Come on, it's the mercy of God that leads us and draws us this afternoon. Come on, child of God, reach up to him. You say, Pastor, you don't know how I messed up. Oh, you don't know how empty that grave is then. You don't know what I've been through. Oh, you don't know what God went through. He's here for you in this house right now. He's here for you right now. 